God was blessed me and I covered my So it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now the devil's game hasn't really changed. On what day the Lord will come? What he promised Adam and Eve, Peter. In oh, the And that power of the play. Five or six people in Adam and Eve. Back. Perhaps good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps the show has begun. I'm Brian, the radio preacher man. I'm sorry, I thought there was going to be another part to this starting, but um, I'm new here, right? <laughs> anyway, God bless everyone who is here tonight, and uh, we are blessed to be alive and well. <sighs> Hallelujah. Blessed to be used of God in this last day. As is our friend C.K. Quarterman, who is joining us tonight, the author of Fallen Angels, Giants, UFO Encounters, and the New World Order. Hmm. Seemingly a book for the times, C.K. Amen. How are you, my friend? I'm fine. Glad to be here tonight. Yes, I recognize that country accent of yours. Seems a little country. South Georgia. <laughs> South Georgia, yeah. That's country, I reckon. Mm hmm. Yes, I had some thoughts, you know. I, if you've been on the show in the past and you were telling us this story of what actually piqued your interest in, uh, in these types of uh, phenomenon, and you were out walking your dog one night, and. Uh, you came across a a being of some sort, and uh, I mean, I guess what's what's piqued my interest in this again is that uh, this sudden interest in hunting Bigfoot. It's a series. It's like a TV show that's on, I think, mm -hmm. the History Channel, but I'm not sure. And all these people are talking about having seen the Sasquatch and all these things in it. It reminded me of your story. And um, I'm curious, do you think what they're seeing is maybe the kind of a being that you saw that night when you were walking your dog? Yes, I'm pretty sure it is. I think that there are different types of them, uh, just like maybe there are different types of dogs and cats and people. Mm -hmm. I think there are different types of them. The one I saw had a dog, a wolf face. And uh, there yeah. are some of them that are that way. But I don't okay. think they're totally... I don't think they're human. You know, they're something mm -hmm. that... Some kind of a hybrid. Now, did it walk away, the thing that you saw? Or did you walk away from it? I don't know. I walked did away it? at high speed. Oh, okay. You're like, come on, boo-boo, we're going back in the house. <laughs> I turned and went toward the house. The dog was already at the door. Oh, the dog yeah. didn't need any encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the dog knew he didn't want to fight that thing. Now, did you hypothesize no. that it was a spiritual being, or, or is this some kind of, a, as you mentioned, a hybrid uh, creation, or... What's your take on what you saw that night? I think it was a physical being. Now, my take on it is that these Sasquatches, big feet, uh, I would prob probably prefer the term hybrid, mm -hmm. is that there is some kind of a supernatural aspect to them because nobody's been able to catch one. You know, they appear yes. and they disappear. So... Mm -hmm. My own personal research seems to indicate that they're like a UFO. They're able to come out of the spiritual realm and into the physical realm and have physical characteristics. But yet they're able to turn around and go back into the spiritual realm and basically they keep from getting caught. 
And I think there will come a day, it talks about in Revelation, that Satan and his emissaries are thrown out of the spiritual realm and thrown out onto the earth. And I think, you know, I think that day we'll see them. But uh, okay. until then, it seems like they're able to hide and go back and forth, just like UFOs are able to, or fallen angels for that matter. So when we get to that place where they're actually cast down to the earth, then they will not have that option of disappearing. You know, Jesus disappeared out of the crowd of people one time when uh, it wasn't time for them to catch him yet. You know. <laughs> right. So, and there's a verse that speaks of Lucifer being thrown to the earth, and I could search and find it real quick, but it's in Revelation. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes, I'm familiar somewhat with that uh that verse as well, but I can't tell you right where it's at either. So, um, I just found that to be interesting. And, uh, that guy, uh, if you've ever watched that show about the Bigfoot, um, the guy Bobo, he reminds me of Alex Jones with, like, a little makeup on and, like, a, a special head wig. You know, he's always got a hat on with his long hair coming out from under it and I'm thinking mm -hmm. I wonder if that guy is like somebody else in disguise <laughs> but, uh, well have you ever heard of the star child skull um, do refresh me and I'll tell you if I've heard of it because it doesn't ring a bell yet well there's a skull that was found uh, supposedly in South America although its origin is uh, not a fact that's actually known, but um, a fellow is supposed to have done DNA studies on it, and uh, the DNA studies seem to indicate that it's not entirely human. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, Genesis, the sixth chapter, talks about hybrids when the sons of God came in and cohabitated with the daughters of men. And then you have that happening again throughout history, um, like Numbers, the 13th chapter, the 33rd verse, and so forth. But most of the time, you know, finding skeletons of giants or anything like that is a little difficult, particularly to be verifiable. But there just seems to be enough smoke, and it's the same thing with these Sasquatch, you know, where there's enough smoke, there's got to be fire somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just seems like there's some thread of truth that's running through it. Yeah, and you're yeah. the only person that I've ever spoken to that directly has seen something of that effect, something that others would consider to have been a Sasquatch sighting. So. Well, I know that... Uh, you know, there seems to be some film of them. I know that mm -hmm. within a couple of weeks of me actually seeing this, there was a motorist on a highway, uh, a county over from where I was at, that mm -hmm. got some kind of picture of some kind of being crossing the road on their cell phone. And wow. they put that up on a blog, and I found it about a month after the book was published, and I added it to uh, one of my websites. So, you know, it seems like there's something going on in that area. It seems like there's something going on in the uh, northwest. There are a lot of Sasquatch sightings out in the northwest. Okay. Hmm, I hadn't... I hadn't heard. I know they, they claim that most states have had some, a lot of, they say Ohio, I think, uh, has had a lot of sightings on that show they reported. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, intriguing stuff, I, I tell you that. I don't know. I, I, I guess uh, I'm concerned, too, uh, when you said I had to face like a wolf. Uh, these people I saw... Uh, on another show, there was a noise-making thing. It was like making a lot of noise outside. They live way out in the woods in the cabin, and they were hearing this unpleasant-sounding noise, almost like a dog, but not quite a dog. And uh, it would wake them up at night. And 
one day they found this thing dead in the in the grass and it looked like it was a hybrid of some kind part dog and part something else and uh, where we used to live we would hear uh, at night something out behind the fence about four or five in the morning sometimes I would hear something out there that I couldn't identify the animal that I was hearing uh, so <laughs> it was a little freaky you know I was glad I had a fence uh, to keep it from you know, just wandering right up into my yard, okay? So, <laughs> that was, uh, I always wondered what in the world that was. It was kind of a chilling thing to hear, you know, well, and see, not being able to identify it. You know, all of these things also share uh, the Bigfoot, the unusual noises and sightings, UFOs, uh, demons ghost, if you would, mm-hmm. uh, they all share some of the same characteristics, which seem to indicate to me that they all have some origin in and around the same thing. Uh, okay. They appear, they disappear, they make noises, they cause fear. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, these Sasquatches, when they show up, the only thing I can find that they ever do is cause fear. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's the same thing with demons. What do demons do? It seems that they are able to get something off of fear, some kind of, uh, uh, they feed off of people's fear. Yes. And now, I have uh, had several people to tell me that they've seen demons, CK. And uh, sometimes they describe the demon very similar to what you described this thing. Maybe not the facial features, but... Uh, I think they see a black figure, you know, a dark, a darkness in the room. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've got a new book uh, coming out within the month uh, uh-huh. called Demons and Deliverance. And Good. on the back of the book, I subtitled, added suffering to it, because I think suffering is part of all of that. But uh-huh. I've seen many demons. And uh, since really? my first book came out, I've talked with people all over the country. Uh, so if you want to take a few minutes and talk about demons sure. and what's going on in that realm, I'll be glad to do that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is quite a, a fitting start for the show. Now, in the back of my mind, before the show started, I thought, now, I know C.K. told me he was writing a new book. Uh, the last time you were on, I think you might have made mention of it, but I couldn't remember the, uh, that it was about anything specifically. So... Uh, this is good. This is good because I think this. What do you think? Does this fall in with the whole vampire phenomenon? And as you mentioned, ghosts and how they're going down into haunted houses in the basement and trying to trap these ghosts and trick these. I think some of this stuff is just really crossing a line. But uh, yeah, well, let's tell. Oh yeah, well, let, we'll sort of try to let's try to break down those questions sort of one at a time and we we can answer them. Uh, To give you a little bit of a background, uh, I was involved in what's called the deliverance ministry. That is casting out demons 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, Back when the book Pigs in the Parlor was the textbook on it. Right. But it went so much in the left field that everything was a demon. And I just parted ways with it. And since I wrote the first book, Fallen Angels, uh, I started getting calls from across the country, in fact, this country and Canada. And uh, sometimes from men, but uh, most of the time from women that were being raped at night by demons. And uh, seeing demons crawling on their walls and attacking them and all kinds of things. And so it sort of spurred me on to go ahead and write a book and start dealing with some of these issues. And one of the things that I learned in the process of all of this, which surprised me, is that in my Christian experience, I had always, you know, been in front of somebody and you know, commanded that demon to come out of them. 
And I found out that just as Jesus was telling the centurion, the, if you remember the story, the centurion came to Jesus and said, my daughter is grievously vexed, mm-hmm. and if you'll just speak the word, she'll be freed. And he did, but he said he'd found no greater faith in all Israel. And mm-hmm. the centurion explained that he was a man under authority. Right. And I found out that when people would call me, and we could spend some time counseling on the telephone or by Skype, and then I was able to pray for them, I was able to get them delivered from these demons. And, of course, the back side of it is I try to stay in touch with them to encourage them and to teach them some basis in the Word. So I, don't, I try not to let them just go. Okay, but out of fine. that came this book. And um, you know, let's let's pull up a popular topic. Let's talk about ghosts. A lot of times, because uh, I deal with all of these things in the book: vampires, ghosts, werewolves. Um, hmm. I've been on a lot of the paranormal shows, and these people go out ghost hunting. Well, hmm. are there ghosts? No. Are there demons that act like ghosts? Yes. Right. See, the Bible says that um, the Apostle Paul said to be absent from the Bible, uh, <laughs> to be absent from the body <clears throat> was to be present with the Lord. And men mm-hmm. are ordained once to die and then to judgment. Yes. So humans don't walk around in the neither places trying to find some kind of rest. They're either going to heaven or they're going to hell. You know, it's like I used to tell people when I was in uh, high school and I first came to the Lord and they'd say, how are you? I'd say, I'm fine, heaven's up, hell's down, you're in between, what's your decision? Wow. You know, that's where humanity is. We're in between. But ghosts are not people that are in between. Ghosts are demons that are familiar with people or places. A lot of times they're referred to as familiars or familiar spirits. Oh, yeah, the Bible now, even talks about that. Now, what a lot of ghost hunters don't tell you, when they go on these ghost hunting trips, these things follow them home. You know, they'll go to a home where there's poltergeist activity, and they don't tell the public this, but when they go home, they find that same activity starts happening in their house. And it's because that type of a spirit, that type of a demon will follow you home. Yeah, well, I mean, you're not very careful about it. And so they, they they really are being unwise. I always thought that looked kind of stupid to be going down in some dark basement chasing after, a, you know, a ghost, quote-unquote, doing a little flashlight thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm like, geez. That's like the Ouija boards. I could never see the logic behind a Ouija board. Even as a kid, I had enough sense to stay away from that thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they always scared me, and I heard bad rumors about them, but I've talked to a mm-hmm. lot of people who did get involved or have been involved in Ouija boards, and they've opened up doors for other worse things to happen. Right. You know, the right. the problem with the Ouija board is, you know, the subconscious isn't moving. That Another name for a Ouija board is table tipping. You know, something's uh-huh. moving that, and it's not you. Right. So and The Old Testament forbids communication with the dead or with demons. Mm-hmm. So anytime you get involved in that, you open up the door for even greater problems in your life. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, that's part of deliverance ministry, CK, is... Uh, people have opened a door a lot of times to let this evil spirit or a group of evil spirits in and uh, one fella comes on here and I, I can't believe I've forgotten his name all of a sudden but uh, 
it'll come to me in a little bit. This happens every time I try to think of his name for some reason. But uh, he says you got to do a door closing prayer before you start doing the exorcism. Have you ever heard of that, where you close the door? Yeah, through which um, yeah, and there's some people refer to uh, what's called a legal right or demon that has a legal right because somebody opened the door. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to tell you in the book that I wrote, um, and I'll tell you how I deal with that. Okay. Is that in my mind, if you go out and you have sex and you get HIV, you've got a certainly a cause and effect. Mm-hmm. You know, you've done something that's caused your problem. Yeah. But there are other times that. Uh, Demons come into people's lives when they've not actually knowingly opened the door. You know, it's okay. like a spirit of infirmity or something like that. It's like under, trying to understand suffering. You know, why does a particular sickness come into somebody's life? Is it because they sinned or they were worse people than other people? Um, in you know, I, like a lot of deliverance ministers will have people go through these prayers of renunciation. Yeah. You know, they'll put them on a sheet of paper and go down a whole list with them. And, you know, I've been there, and I've heard that, and I wouldn't disagree with somebody doing that. I wouldn't stand out and say, hey, you don't have to do that. But I noticed that when Jesus dealt with the demoniac of the gatherings, he didn't ask demon, how did he come in there? He didn't uh-huh. ask that man, what sins did you commit that opened this door for these thousand demons? In fact, the only communication he had with him was to tell him to come out and what his name was. Uh-huh. So, you know, I try to remember that, you know, Jesus is our example True. and not other people. And I so don't you don't need to have place. a big conversation with the demon before you get down to business. You just <laughs> right, and I, I, I know people who have conversations with them, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't think I don't think you need to do that. I've kind of wondered about you know that too. If that's, uh, I mean, I could see if you were having trouble casting the thing out, and you're trying to. You know, like playing a game of chess, you're trying to figure out how to get the upper hand on the the demon. But we really have the authority in the name of Jesus. You know, it's not by any of our own strength that that thing's going to come out in the first place. So, um, <laughs> maybe you're right, CK. Well, you know, some of the times I've been involved in it with other people, they'll ask the demon what legal right did he have to be there. And you know, the demon might say, well, the grandfather was involved in sorcery or something like that. You know, and my question is, this is a demon you're asking. How do you know he's telling the truth? <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's true. You know, and my own personal perspective on it is that I trust in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. You know, if I'm going to deal with deliverance, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Lord to show me what I need to know, to tell me what I need to know. And sometimes I will see the demons. I mean, I've seen demons of crack cocaine. Uh, I've seen other kinds of demons wrapped around people. And any time you see something like that or the, or the Lord gives you a word of knowledge and tells you this is what that is, it always comes with the ability to, to deliver that person. To give you an example, I had a young woman um, that I talked with and, you know, we talked a little while about what was going on and she was one of these uh I mean, just people who are being raped at night. Mm -hmm. And this is a horrible thing to talk about even or to to think about, but some evil presence gets on top of the woman and just rapes them. And sometimes this can go on multiple times in an evening. 
and sometimes it can go on every night. And this woman called me, and as I talked with her, I really didn't have any answers as to why this might have happened to her. And I said, well, before we pray, let's just be quiet a minute here, and let's ask the Lord if there's anything he wants to show us. And as I did that, in my heart, I just heard the word rape. And I asked her, I said, uh, Miss So-and-so, have you ever been raped? And she broke into tears over the phone. And she said, when I was a teenager, I was raped. And I said, well, I said, darling, I want you to know that's where this spirit came into your life. And what we're going to do right now is pray specifically about that. And I'm going to command him to leave you. And she's not had a problem since. Wow. And so you think you don't think this was somehow in her subconscious as like remembering in her sleep she was maybe dreaming about that incident where she was raped or was it very different? No, it's always very different. Like a young man that I talked to recently, this was a man... And this goes back to even literature in the Middle Ages. They were called incubus and succubus. Uh, mm-hmm. But this man was telling me just the other evening that uh, he'd lay down on his bed and this presence would all of a sudden come on him and start choking him and then start having sex with him. And this would happen two or three times a night. Lord. He would be wide awake. Wow. Wow. Makes you want to not go to bed. You know, how well, they do in the movies. Well, if you got those they... kind of things going on, yeah, it, it's probably pretty difficult. Now, yeah, this yeah. younger woman I was telling you about would see this demon, this black shape, crawling on the ceiling before what happened to her. Mm-hmm. So, so, most of the time, these people are wide awake. They're not sleeping and waking up in the middle of the night from some kind of dream you know, this is not sleep paralysis. This is demonic uh, forces. But they are able to gain victory over this. In the name of Jesus, without fail. Now, what I have to teach them is I can command those demons to go away from them and they'll leave. But what I have to seriously do, and it, and it deals with the kind of spirits these things are, they will come back and see if there's a way to get back. And so they have to be taught that when they see this thing coming again, to do just like I've done is speak to it and command it to go in the name of Jesus. And when they're able to do that, they will walk free the rest of their life from it. Wow, that's and amazing. I've what I've heard time and time again. Hmm? I've heard the same story that you just gave me uh, probably about a year ago when uh, Joel Joseph was on and he was talking about aliens coming in and and messing with people in their sleep, you know, and trying to come in and rape them and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the same thing. If if they tell them, no, in the name of Jesus, be gone, they have to leave. They go away. And I I believe that there's... Yeah, the alien... alien same. Abduction syndrome is the same thing as demons and fallen angels. And they're mm-hmm. subject to the same thing, and I treat them the same way. Yeah, but it's the same situation that you're giving me. And a mm-hmm. friend of mine, way back in high school, a um, friend of mine had uh, woke up in the middle of the night, and there was, uh, well, he felt something sit down on his bed. And uh, he could feel the weight of something sit on his bed, and he kind of woke up a little bit, and he saw like a big, you know, just a black figure there, a uh, shadowy figure, um, pretty much described like what you're saying these other people are seeing. And he had did a rebuke it in Jesus' name. He was a Christian, you know. And he oh, rebuked yeah. it in Jesus' name, and I don't believe it ever happened again. Uh that I heard him speak of, but um, it's like this. If he had not known to say instinctively in the name of Jesus, no way, get up out of here, or be gone, you know, or rebuke it in the name of Jesus, 
it's hard telling what might have happened. He might have had a similar uh, experience mm-hmm. as with this other young man you were telling me about. Well, so. I've been, I personally have been sitting on the bed and not only feel a presence sit on the bed, but see the actual sheets in the bed go down. Now, do you think they have a personal vendetta against you because of your work in that area? Oh, yeah. Over the years? Yeah, they definitely do, yeah. <laughs> they don't like me. In <laughs> fact, uh, when I start talking to people, uh, it's very often that the, the people who are having problems with demons will start hearing vo- the voices and start telling them, you don't want to talk to him. You don't want anything to do with him. Uh, Most of the time, it'll have the opposite effect. It'll actually draw them to me because it scares them out of their wits. When they but hear yeah, those demons voices. don't want anything to do with me. Wow. They definitely... They definitely don't like me. <laughs> well, I can't say that the feeling isn't mutual, though. <laughs> so this thing you saw, you and your dog, that night, um, this was after you had already been involved in deliverance ministry, or was it before then? Well, it uh, was before the deliverance ministry became really paramount, which is when the book came out, but I've been involved in deliverance ministry for 20 years, off and on. You know, so, so about... I, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to ask about when it was that you saw this thing off in the distance, and how far off in the distance was it from where you and your dog were at? Oh, well... You know, having said I've, I've been in and around the deliverance ministry most of my Christian experience, uh, that's one reason I know it was a physical presence and not a spiritual presence. I've seen, you know, I've seen both. Mm-hmm. But uh, we were probably 20 feet from it. Wow. So, and you said it was real tall, like, uh, kind of like how it they was, described it. Yeah, it was standing next to a tree, so I didn't have anything to gauge its actual height by other than it was much taller than an individual. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, you know, it didn't leave any question in my mind that it was some type of hybrid and it didn't have any business being there, and I wasn't going to stick around and ask it. Yeah, so you um, you didn't look... I mean, once you got in the house, did you look and it was gone, or how did that go down? Well, I bolted the door and told my wife about the experience, and we got to talking about it. So I took the gun and went back outside, and we looked for it, but we didn't see it. Oh, okay. So you were going to sort of I see was you a coward could... without a gun. I don't mind telling you. Yeah. Feet saved the body. <laughs> okay, well, this is interesting. So your book, Demons and Deliverance, then, first of all, you've got to um, you've got to get the demon out of the people, but part of deliverance you mentioned was training them up how to uh, combat the demons themselves, then, eh? For long-term effect? Right, uh... Delivering a person from the demonic oppression that they're under is the first step. And then the second step is teaching them to stand on their own. And to do that, you have to have a certain degree of follow-up. And uh, staying in contact with that person. And I think a lot of deliverance ministers miss that point. You know, they're just not willing to put forth that kind of an effort. But I think it's, it's necessary. Because yeah. the type of demons that I've experienced that do these kind of things always seem to come back to test that person. And, of course, as a biblical example of that, it says when the house has been swept clean, the demon walks around in dry places, and he comes back, looks, and sees that the house is clean. And if he finds it's clean, he goes and gets several more worse than himself. Yeah. But... You know, there's also, I might say this too, and I've had psychologists ask me this, and I am quite forward about this, is I think there is a difference in mental illness and 
demonic oppression. And if I feel mm-hmm. like I'm talking with somebody who has a mental illness, I have no problem in telling them that they need to see a psychiatrist first and me second. That doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I had one uh, young girl a couple of months ago who I think, I mean, it was my personal opinion that she is paranoid schizophrenic. But I didn't okay. feel... I didn't feel good dealing with her until she was under some kind of medical treatment. And that, that's what I told her. And uh, so, so I sent her to So what did she a, say to that? First. Hmm? What did she say when you said that? Was she there because she, listened, she felt like... but she didn't get back to me. Sometimes people don't hear what they want to hear. Yes. Interesting that you mentioned uh, the paranoid schizophrenia because um, I have a friend who comes on the show uh, and and uh, he has uh, been to visit um, oh David uh, Berkowitz who is he was a uh, serial killer you know uh-huh. back uh, twenty thirty years ago and now he's in prison of course for life. Well, this is the son of Sam, isn't it? Yes, I think so. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, he has found Jesus as he's mm-hmm. been incarcerated and he was actually delivered from schizophrenia uh, and, and that's what they diagnosed him as being a schizophrenic uh, prior to his salvation experience and uh, according to my friend Robert Ryland he is now the uh the happiest guy in the prison. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, because he, he knows the peace that comes with knowing the Lord. And I mean, it doesn't change the fact that he's in prison for life because of some terrible things. And so I guess this is the importance of people being delivered, CK, is because if we let things go long enough, it's hard telling what kind of terrible things can happen to a person or to their life. Uh, just point well, blank. one of the things that I talk about, and I hope comes across in the book, and I talk about a lot of subjects in the book, some of which are things like suffering. Uh, I talk about mm-hmm. the book of Job, and I have a different take on the book of Job than you probably have ever heard before. Uh, well, let's hear it, because I've read three or four books about the book of Job when I was doing a paper for it uh, in in college. And uh, so I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on that book. I don't think the book of Job was written so that we would understand suffering. I think the book of Job was written so that the nation of Israel would have an insight into what was going on in its history. Mm. And I think because of that, we've gotten a wrong understanding of suffering and what's going on. You think it was so they could reflect upon it, like during the 400 years when they were in in captivity with Egypt and all? Right, when they were roasting in the ovens and during the Nazi regime. Mm-hmm. I think the book of Job was written to the nation of Israel, not to, not to Christians to understand suffering. And I okay. think it warped Christianity's understanding of suffering. Uh, how so? Let's let's ask you that. What do you think it's done as far well, as how it's influenced our, our view of suffering? Well, number one, I think that there are not always answers to it. I think that the Bible is quite quiet on the subject of why suffering exists or why an individual might be going through suffering. You know, there are some things that we're told, things like chastisement, but then you've got the church at Corinth that has rapid uh, fornication going on within it, but yet chastising is not going on. Uh, One person is singled out, and the Apostle Paul says, I'll deal with him when I get there. Mm -hmm. So... You know, then you look at the Apostle Paul's life himself and the suffering he goes through. And uh, 
you know, he's given an answer as to why he suffers, but there's nothing done to relieve his suffering. Yeah, that darn in flesh. Yes, mm-hmm. and whatever that may have been, which was probably um, persecution kind of stuff, but, you know, as Christians, you know, we want easy answers. You know, yeah. it's like the I was involved in the faith movement years ago, and its standard answer, you pray for somebody to be healed, and if they're not healed, it is they didn't have enough faith. Well, mm-hmm. I have an answer for that. It's an empty hand on an empty head. You know, and yeah, I well. deal with, you know, and, and in the book, I make, the main point of, other than talking about demons and so forth, the main point that I build to is if there's any fault as to why we don't see healing today, and mm-hmm. we don't see it like we should, is because the church does not operate as the New Testament church should. And I go into what it should look like and how it should operate and uh, what's wrong with it. And that's where I put the blame is on the fact that the church in the 21st century is not operating like the 1st century church. Okay, that's intriguing. Uh, we are definitely not. I think we're approaching the days of apostate uh, and apostasy in a lot of in a lot of ways. And so, I think that uh, I don't think the church is moving sometimes in the spiritual realm in the same way we were even 25 or 30 years ago. Just in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that a lot of people are calloused or cold or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're just too busy with our own little lives to be concerned about others. I'm not sure enough for the spirit to work within us, you know. Um, I'm not sure what to say about all that. I do know well, as far also, as suffering. Yeah, you know, I and I I watch a lot of what goes on on Facebook and so forth, and there's a lot of judgmentalness among the body of Christ that. Uh, they judge one another. They judge movements that are going on. and um, You know, it makes me just, when I look around and I see a thousand churches, you know, you can take one city almost and you can find a thousand churches. You know, it All makes right. me ask the question, what's wrong? And then I go back to the Bible and I look at it, and I find out that, the letters to the churches, like there's a letter to the church of Corinth, there's a letter to the church of Galatia, of Philippi, and so forth. And mm-hmm. each of these letters, very interestingly, is written to the elders, and that's in plural. None of, none of the epistles are written to a pastor. But yet, if you wrote a letter to any church in the 21st century, you would write it to the pastor. All right. That tells you right there that there's something wrong. Intriguing uh, observation there, C.K. I like that. So what are you saying? We've got the church established where the pastor is at the head, and that's not necessarily where he's supposed to be. That's correct. In the early church, you did not have a one-mind leadership. Okay. You had elders in the plural that led the flock, and they were not full-time ministers. Mm -hmm. See, that's a whole different concept than what we have in the 21st century. We have people doing ministry because they're being paid to do it. In the church at Corinth, you had people coming with a psalm or hymn, a spiritual song, something to give out at each service. Mm -hmm. And they came together and they participated. Now, most ministers that I know of will look at the book of the church at Corinth and say there's all kind of disorganization going on there. God doesn't like confusion. 
and they'll go as far as they can to put their fingers and squelch everything so far that everything works on a bulletin. But the truth mm-hmm. is, give me whatever rambunctiousness you want to if God will come in the middle of it and heal somebody. Mm-hmm. And that's what you find in the church of Corinth. You find the body ministering to the body. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to have, you know, the the C.K. Quartermans of the worlds or the Bryans of the worlds or the other people, blah, blah, and blahs of the world getting out there and saying, hey, brother, let me put my hands on your shoulder. I feel God's wanting to bless you, you know, and you've got to do that in front of uh, 500 people, and they're all sitting in nice, neat rows looking at the back of everybody's head. That's just not going to happen. You know, you've yeah. got to have body fellowship. you got to get away from looking at the back of everybody's head and one man doing everything. It's got to be elder. Yeah. And it's got to be the body pulling together and ministering to itself. So I put the blame for why is healing not happening today and why are so many people sick today. I put it squarely on the shoulders of the church not being the church it's supposed to be. If it were, James, the fifth chapter, you bring somebody up and you anoint him with all, God forgives his sins and heals him, how come that's not happening? Mm-hmm. Just explain to me. That's very easy, very clear, very plain. Why does it not happen? I have my own explanation as to why it doesn't happen, and I'll tell you in the book why I think it is. Mm-hmm. So I see, think these uh, are questions that are hard, and we need to take a look at them. Yes, sir. We need God today more than we've ever needed Him before. As times get dark and things get tough, we need true authentic movements of God and they're going to come from people like you and I and brother and sister. They're not coming from the apostle and the pastor of this so and so. I agree with you and I think that the the guest coming on in the second hour here in about 10 minutes would agree with you as well. Uh, I've heard I've heard it spoken from the pulpit in his church that uh, same kind of philosophy. We're not here to grow the church in numbers. We're here to grow it outward. Go out there and, and do what you can for the kingdom of God. And in fact, we had a great discussion last night on the kingdom of God when Daniel Duvall was on. But Chris Ward is uh, coming on in the next hour. I don't know if you know him. but uh, uh, I know him he, vaguely. I've met him on Facebook and I think a lot of him. Yeah, he does. Uh, he's 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 does deliverance ministry, as well as he pastors a church and he um, does a, a great ministry with the homeless and uh, the veterans primarily. He's a, a veteran and he has a a real desire to help with the veterans that are down on their luck, you know. And mm-hmm. the guy's just uh, he's a, he's up your alley. I could tell you by what you're saying here. Because he believes that uh, church, in, and I've heard this said many times, church is not to be a spectator sport, CK. That's we right. are to be involved. And I told God That's... just tonight, in fact, I think I told my producer, I'm just glad that I'm able to be used in this last day to to do a ministry, you know. Well, I think that you hit the nail on the head is that the 21st century church has become a spectator sport. And it never was intended to be that way, and it just will not work that way. You will not have God working in that manner. It's just not going to happen because it's not set up to happen that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's very uh, very intriguing, this topic. And I think as far as the suffering goes, um, I remember the uh, the time where it's, uh, I believe it's when Jesus healed the the fellow that had been blind for like uh, 30 years or something crazy. And they were like, well, who sinned, him or his parents, that he would be right. born blind? And Jesus said, neither. You know, this boy, he spent, I think it was 38 years blind just so that, I think, in my hypothesis, is so God could get the glory for healing him on that day in front of those people that gave a testimony to God. Now, it's a 
it's crazy to think that guy had to suffer for that many years. <laughs> and so maybe there was more to it than that, CK. I don't know, but I don't like to think that every birth defect is well, because somebody sinned. That doesn't make sense either. Well, in in my mind, as oftentimes Jesus did, is he didn't answer a question. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, that's, maybe that sounds funny when I say that, but oftentimes, like with the Pharisees and the, Repub- and the publicans and so forth, uh, mm-hmm. he really never answered their question. And I think in that particular case, in my mind, you know, there may be part of an answer, but there certainly is not a full answer there. What he was saying was that the man was not blind because of sin. And in the okay. Jewish belief system in the first century, uh, and he dealt with this a couple of different times because he dealt with this with the Tower of uh, Shalom as well when it fell. And he said, did you think the people who it fell on were worse sinners than those who it didn't? You know, uh-huh. and one of the things we look for, even as Christians, and I hit this up hard in the book, is mm-hmm. we want cause and effect. Somebody's sick, we think they've sinned. If somebody's sick, we think they've done something wrong, and that's ingrained in us. And the and I think Jesus teaches specifically that that is not always true. That sometimes wow. there is no answer for that, and we need to get off of Christians' back sometimes, and giving the poor sick people a hard time, and we need to pray for mm-hmm. them and not condemn them. You know, one right. of the things I talk about so much, and I don't want to get on a roll here, but psychotropic medicines. Uh-huh. There are Christians who have uh, chemical imbalances. They need something like an antidepressant. Well, uh-huh. they can't tell another Christian they take an antidepressant because all of a sudden you got a demon or you need to pray your way through that. But if they had a broken bone, the other Christian would be saying, oh, you poor darling. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Better go get that set. <laughs> they tell them, you need a ride to the high doctor? We'll get that set, you know. But yet, if it's a mental thing, yeah, it does scare people, or we tend to want to blame it on a spiritual issue. You're absolutely right. That's wow. right. And, you know, sometimes, and I hope this comes out in the book, sometimes there may be. Sometimes a spiritual issue causes an imbalance. Sometimes an imbalance can open a door for a spiritual issue. Let's say that a person has an imbalance that tends toward depression. Well, Mm -hmm. they lean toward depression and start going in that direction. A little demon hops along and says, don't you really hate yourself? Oh, you're just such a sorry little individual. And they start Mm -hmm. listening to that then all of a sudden they've got a demon and a physical imbalance. Wow. But sometimes the demon could get on a normal person and create enough of a problem that it causes an imbalance. So when we're dealing with stuff like healing, you need words of wisdom and knowledge, and some things are just... Like depression, for instance, oftentimes is a natural occurrence. As people get older, they tend more to depression because the the synapses in the brain don't create as much serotonin as they used to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we need is we need a lot more mercy, understanding, and prayer in the body of Christ and a whole lot less condemning. That's good. That's really good. Now, tell us... uh CK, I know you've got the website FallenAngelsToday.com and GenesisSecretsRevealed.com. Is that the correct two websites uh, for your works? Well, that's true. And I've also got CK Quarterman, Q-U-A-R-T-E-R-M-A-N.com, uh-huh. which is uh, my main blog. But the new book okay. will be uh, also will have its own website, and it will also be on Amazon very shortly. Okay, and it's, it's going to Amazon. And Deliverance. dot com. Wow. Now, one of the things so, we're going to offer at Demons and Deliverance. dot com 
is uh, be an email address. It's up, in fact, there's a, it's up there on the site now, even though the book's not yet available for about another 30 days, uh, mm-hmm. is my email address. And we're going to offer free counseling to anybody who contacts us and, you know, is willing to do some follow-up once we pray with them. You know, and we, oh. of course, we're going to want them okay. to know Christ. But we're going to offer them free counseling to anybody that contacts us. So if a person has a demon, they don't have to have any money. We're going to pray that demon off them. Amen. That's excellent. So what you said before, you said the church needs to have more mercy and understanding and less condemnation. Is that correct? That's right. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm writing that down. I kind of like that quote. And less condemnation. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, this could go a long way because uh, we're in this time where the church really needs to start unifying a little bit and standing up for our rights, you know. I'm just concerned. You know, we have real enemies out there besides other denominations. You know, this is the thing people, uh, maybe denominationalism is starting to fade a little as uh, mm-hmm. as we reach this new millennium and we get going real good in it. But, uh, I mean, there are actual uh, enemies out there, and the devil has done a great job of blindsiding many, many people and, uh, you know, giving them a partial truth, if you will. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's part of the problem where we see all this division and then many denominations... But it's also a lot of political bureaucracies inside of denominations, CK. And maybe that's part of what leads to the phenomenon you were saying, where they set the pastor up as the head. And then the pastor is afraid to say anything because he might lose his position. Well, it's also money. And that's one of the things Mm -hmm. we're going to do with this new book, um, Demons and Deliverance. Uh, It's going to be available for download as a PDF file for free. It won't cost a person anything to look at it and read it on their computer. You know, if they want to go get a paperback version or a Kindle version, they can go to Amazon and get that. But we're going to make it available for free. Wow. And, uh, I, I think graft, greed, if you would, money is one of the biggest problems in the church world today. And if we yep. can get away from, you know, it, it just... You know, the early church just just did not know anything like what we know today in in greed and graft. I know a man, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I know a man that if you want to sit down and have a demon cast out of you, he'll do it, but he wants $500. Wow. Now, you tell me if when he gets to heaven, Jesus isn't going to have a few words of prayer with him. (laughs) Yep, yep. He might be one of them that said, Lord, didn't I cast out demons in your name? <laughs> he, he might be, but I kid you not, I know of one that's like that. Wow. That's you know, amazing. It, it, people need help. They don't need to be charged for help. And mm-hmm. the church needs to be, um, you know, if it didn't have every, if it wasn't a social club, it didn't have all the bills to pay, the full-time pastors to pay. It would be different. True. That is true. They have big budgets, some of them, so it's, uh... (sighs) It is what it is, man. But, well, we want to say thank you for coming up on here on the Revelation Per Minute broadcast, and I, I hope you have much success with your ministry and getting them demons out of folks, and, uh, thank you for your efforts and your 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 work and your research on this book uh, in advance. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to get a look at it when it comes out. So, well, God Brian, bless you. Well, I appreciate you. you having me on tonight. All right. Well, you have a beautiful night, CK. You too as well. Thank you, Brian. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back after this short break. With Pastor Chris Ward is coming on from logoschristian.org. God bless. Back in a flash.
Well, I don't hear any music playing, children. So I'm not sure what's really going on here as to whether we're taking a break or not. <laughs> I will email my brother and see if the caller have arrived already. I say, do we have uh, Chris Ward with us at this time? Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not right sure. I don't hear any music, so I can only assume that the break is not occurring at this time. And so therefore, we'll let it go. We'll let it go. We'll just push through, as my wife says. Push through. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to look a little bit until Chris calls in. I want to look into the uh, Psalm 89. And, um, well, the 89th Psalm, according to this uh, box here in my Bible, it says, it is both the confirmation and exposition of the Davidic Covenant that is found in Second Samuel 7, 8-16. And now the covenant itself looks far beyond David and Solomon and uh, higher than the kings of the earth can only refer to Emmanuel, which is God with us, our Lord Jesus. Amen. And of course, David knew through this covenant, the Davidic covenant, that the Savior, the Messiah for the world was going to come through his lineage through his uh, bloodline. And uh, that was, um, I'm sure, quite exciting for him. But uh, it is amazing how God has chosen certain men. If you look at uh, the Abraham uh, and the Abrahamic uh, covenant, how God chose one man and uh, he put that favor on him. And he was not without testing, though. I mean, even to the point that uh, Moses is the same. These men were tested. They had a special relationship with God, and then they heard from God. But yet, for some reason, God felt a need to test these men and push them, uh, such as in Abraham's situation, he was to take his beloved son Isaac, and you all have heard the story, whereas he was promised to have a son, though he had no children. He was promised he would have uh, a multitude of seed greater than the sands of the oceans. Well, hence the name Abram, which meant the father of many. But yet the irony was he never had children. He went on and on. He loved his wife Sarah, and uh, but she was barren. He couldn't have children with her there. Now, we assume she was barren. I don't know if the Bible specifies which of them it was. I think it says she was barren. Um, yeah, that's true, because he had the, the child with Hagar. <laughs> so we know he wasn't the one who was uh, having the, uh, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the uh, offspring issues. That's not the word I'm looking for, the... Uh, Reproductive issues, maybe, is a better term. Um, but our father Abraham, he did go on to father many nations, folks. And it was only after he was tried and he grew impatient, waiting on the promise. God made a promise to them. Oh, hallelujah. If God makes a promise to you, folks, let's make it a... Uh, an, an idea here tonight that we will wait on the Lord to fulfill that promise. Because sometimes we can jump the gun, so to speak, and, uh, or in this case of Abraham, jump the handmaid, however you want to look at it. But that's, that's a little brash, Brian. But either way, they took matters into their own hands and made a child that they were going to raise to themselves, Sarah and Abraham, by 
by way of Hagar, which was um, Sarah's handmaid, which ironically, uh, she was an Egyptian woman, Hagar, and I find that quite ironic. And then, of course, you know the story, and Israel ends up in slavery to Egypt for 400 years down the road. But um, the point is, is, I'm getting off base here, the point is, is that we have men who have shown us examples of men who were chosen by God, who were tried by God, and who came through with flying colors. Abraham took Isaac up the hill. Uh, well, they made an altar, and they had the, uh, the the kindling wood, to, and he had his knife and everything, and his boy even asked him, he's like, Dad, we got all this wood and everything, but uh, where is the sacrifice and uh, as many folks know, in the King James Version, it said, God will provide himself a sacrifice, which he ultimately did in the form of Jesus Christ. And uh, so we have many blessings because of that situation. But the point I'm making is, is that Isaac passed the test. David was tested. David had opportunities in his lifetime and sometimes we pass tests and sometimes we fail them, all right? We're human. But uh, the test I'm referring to is when he was out in the book of, uh, I think it was Second Samuel, maybe First Samuel, but um, where he um, had an opportunity to take out his enemy, which was his father-in-law, King Saul. Yes. Yes, supposedly, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was waiting for the break at 7. I, I said we're going to... And... Uh, well, uh, <laughs> that's her idea. My idea is... That's craziness. Sometimes the brother needs a little break, you know, so he can get a cup of coffee or whatever. I don't have no maid over here. <laughs> you know, Um, well, I, I'm good. I mean, I mean, I think he's going to be calling in soon, so I'll just kind of, okay, I guess make that little sound, that dilute sound that comes through when he's here, so I'll know. Until then, I'm going to try to attempt to teach about the Davidic covenant, yes, and the Abrahamic covenant and these kind of things and how God makes promises, although I could use a cup of coffee. Uh -huh. uh, all right, God bless you, sir. <clears throat> oh, and God bless you, my child. I heard his child in the background. But... Ah, praise Jesus. Now, I could use that cup of coffee if Monique wakes up and I'll have her stir me up one. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Sometimes she do. But the Lord... Uh, is glorified for his power and goodness in connection with the covenant. And that's the key we want to remember. No matter the covenant, whether it's Abraham, Moses, uh, Noah, rather, um, or, or, or David, God gets the glory and his name is lifted up when these covenants are proven to be real and they come to fruition. So, um, and uh, the Lord responds, verse 3 says, and verses 19 to 37, says the Lord responds, and this is uh, in two parts. We probably need to read this psalm in order to follow along with what they're saying in the commentary. But in Psalm 89, in the King James Version, it says in verse 1, it says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. The problem with me reading the Bible before the commentary is you're going to end up getting some of my commentary in here. I'm feeling the, 
the presence of the Lord when I start reading the Word. There's something about the Bible, folks. I did some reading earlier today. I didn't bring the book in here. It's Maybe I did. Well, I won't show you what book it was because I don't want to bring any discredit to an author of another book. But uh, it wasn't C.K., by the way. Ah, and it wasn't Pastor Ward. But there's another book I've been trying to read lately, and it seems to go somewhat in circles to the point that it's like I can't understand what the guy's trying to say. Just like you guys are like, well, we can't understand you either, Brother Wilson. Ha! <laughs> but, uh, but the point I'm making is that I get frustrated trying to read this book, and it's a book about the Bible and how to understand the book of Revelation and when this is going to happen and when that's going to happen. And, and uh, well, by the time the guy gets done talking, I've learned about nothing. So it's it's like I get relief from reading the Bible. I'm like, wow, I could be reading the Bible. And and there's no replacing the Word of God itself, folks. All the commentaries, all the books written about the Bible, they're fine and dandy, but sometimes you got to just stop. And I was impressed last night with Daniel Duvall when he was on and how he would say this verse says this and this verse says that. Because though I quote verses often, I... I have a hard time with, like, this verse. Eh, and say where it is exactly. But, um... Just a moment of it. It's life. But here in this Bible, when I start reading this Word of God, I feel the presence of God almost immediately. You know? So, bear with me as I attempt to share with you this Word from the Bible. Psalms 89. Verse 3, I have made a covenant. Here it is. The magic word for the evening. Covenant. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. Now, folks, you'll see that there is a similarity to the Abrahamic covenant that I mentioned earlier in that there is that promise that the seed, his children, in other words, will be established forever. But in this case, he's talking about the seed, the one seed, the messianic seed, the child of Christ, Jesus, hallelujah, who was born through the bloodline of David. Mm, hallelujah. But also in, in, in Abraham's case, wow, he was promised to be the father of many, you know, and many nations. Hallelujah. And these men and women, and wow, besides the 12 tribes that came through, through his bloodline after Isaac came Jacob and his, his 12 sons, were the ultimately the twelve tribes of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel when he wrestled with the angelic being that night, which some hypothesize was the Lord himself, and that was a Christophany. You can come to your own conclusion on that. But um, I kind of lean toward that, because God's liking to change people's names just like he changed Saul to Paul. You know, after his Damascus Road experience that we love to talk about so much. I'm not sure what my name is uh, with God. <laughs> I'm sure he's come up with a, a name for me that I will know when I get to heaven. Amen. But um, anyway, there's a similarity in these covenants because it's, it's got to do with the seed, and you'll even remember in the Noahic covenant. I'm, I mean, in in Noah's day, uh, there was definitely something to do with seed going on there because it got down to him and his his sons and his sons' wives, and uh, the rest of the people were wiped up off of the earth, were destroyed by that horrendous flood because of the corruptness of the seed. The corruptness and the morality of man uh, had grown to just be a stench in the nostrils of God. And folks, there's a lot of bad things going on again in the world. And I hope that we're not to the point that they were in the days of Noah. But um, 
I think that mankind will continue its its immoral slide, if you will, uh, slide into immorality, however you want to word that, see, and that eventually we will again make that stench in the nostrils of God, which will cause him to regret the creation of man to some extent. And I believe that we're blessed in that he will shorten the days so that the very elect can be saved. Now, your job and my job is to ensure that we are the very elect of God and that we will be spared and that we will stand before him and that God will see the righteousness of the blood of Jesus Christ on our lives. Amen. And that is occurring when you repent and receive the Spirit of God. I'm telling you, you can also wear a robe of white. So folks, if this if this day you're finding chaos in the world and you have not turned to the Lord with your heart, soul, body, and mind, I want to encourage you to do that. I really do. And there's no time like the present. I believe we're looking for the, the last revival. It's already started in many countries. They're having beautiful revival. I've heard it was uh, in Central America and South America and the globe. There are many people who are hungry. Even in the Middle East, there are people hungry for a move of the Spirit of God. People want the truth. Now, I'm not saying the, the masses, maybe the masses. I, I don't know. We're influenced by the Western way of thinking. But, um, I suppose that God is going to pour out His Spirit one last time. I certainly hope so, for the sake of mankind. But um, back to what we were reading in verse uh, 5 of Psalms 89, we see that the heavens shall praise thy wonders. Let's, uh, let's read that again. And the I'm going to read four again. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? Ooh, I know one, hallelujah, my Savior Jesus, hallelujah, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Hallelujah. Mm. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. The heavens are thine. The earth is also thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. You know, if you turn to the book of John, and I'm going to try to find it really, really fast. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All right. And uh, I believe it's right there in the first chapter, Brian. And well, here it says, the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh, amen, and dwelt among us. Let's start from, uh, I was looking for the verse that said, and for thy pleasure all things were created. But essentially, uh, huh. Let's just start in the first verse, and maybe we'll come across it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, John 1 and 1. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Amen. 
all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So this is similar to what we just read. Lord, that, why, but unto thee have I cried. No, 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 over here, Brian. Okay. The heavens are thine. The earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. Praise God. The north and the south, thou hast created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in thy name. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Hmm. I'm going to come back to 15 in just a moment, but I want to look over here to Book of John again. Book of John, chapter 1. Amen. Ah, God help us. Amen. It's talking about Jesus again. It says, He was in the world. And the world was made by Him. And the world knew Him not. This is this is sad, folks. But this is how it was. And He said, If the world hated me, then they're going to hate you too. He came unto His own. And His own received Him not. <sighs> I'm grieving when I think about the fact that He was born a Jew and primarily the Jewish folks are still looking for their messianic figure and they have not accepted that Jesus Christ may have been that figure and I pray that some will even now we need to pray um, what is today the fifth I believe um, I believe it's today or maybe the seventh that uh, brother Todd Baker is going to Israel to witness and to pass out the uh, Bri Harasha, which is uh, the Bible in Hebrew. And it contained the Old Testament and the New Testament both. And of course, he uh, is very selective. He has to know that the person who wants that book and is interested in that book and is interested in knowing more about the Savior. He doesn't just give them out to the people who are going to take him and uh, persecute him because of it, you know. Um, that's called godly wisdom, I suppose, and we need to pray for him to have that, and God would go before him, and I believe he's taken one other team member with him on this excursion, which is his 26th to Israel. But my point is that, uh, oh wow, he needs our prayers, brothers and sisters. He's going over there to introduce some of these people to Jesus, who... As the Bible says, they did not recognize him or receive him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, John 1, 11. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So let's pray that a few more of our Jewish brethren, and definitely a few more of us Gentiles, come to know the Lord in spirit and in truth. While there is time, folks, amen, we must work while it is daylight, for soon it will be the night time when no man can work. Verse 13 continues, these, these were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. So I believe this is inquiring and is inferring to the fact that these people have received the Spirit of God. And whether they be Jew or Gentile, uh, once you've received the Spirit of God, you are His. And He won't let you go. So I want to encourage you in that respect. Uh, he is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother and... Uh, he said, I would never leave you or forsake you. Jesus promised us that. So, come what may, we can rest assured in our salvation. Uh, there's another situation with my memory. Um, who's the brother? Comes on here quite often. Well, anyway, 
very aggravating when I can't remember someone's name because I've always done very well with remembering people's names um, in the past. So, anyway, um, what he says is uh, we get to the other side and we just keep living. And I'm sorry if you're listening, brother, and I can't remember your name. That's so embarrassing. Um my goodness, and my wife's not awake for me to ask her. But <laughs> sometimes we rely on our wives too much for memory. And uh, anyway, carrying on into 14, I'm not real sure what I was going to say now anyway. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld its glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. And John bare witness to him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. Hallelujah. And I, I was studying earlier today and uh, in the book of Leviticus, and it was talking about sacrifices that were done on behalf of men who had done wrong in the eyes of the Lord. And I found it interesting that, uh, you know, we all know the story about the lambs and how they would do the the scapegoat, rather. And uh, they would take two goats and uh, they would send one out into the uh, wilderness, you know, and they still do that today. They put a ribbon around the one and send it out into the wilderness to represent the sins of the people. That they don't, uh, I don't believe they kill the other animal. Maybe they still do. I, I better be quiet. I need to. Um, what I did notice in the in the Bible, though, in the Book of Leviticus, is that they would sometimes take two turtle doves, and they would do a similar thing, and they would kill the one dove. But they would put the blood from that dove on the other one and make his feathers all red with the blood of the other dove and then set him loose into the wilderness. Uh, and that would represent him taking the sins of the people out into the wilderness as well. So this is the same philosophy in that uh, we... we um, need to have a blood covering for our sin. And I'm not hypothesizing or recommending that we start killing animals again. But what I am uh, going to suggest is that you give your life to the Lord today. Free and completely free you can become if you let the blood of Jesus cover you. He says he, he will take your sins as far as the east is to the west and will cover them and he will not even remember them. The Lord will forget your sins. I mean, not only are they gone, but they are forgotten now. I'm not sure what all goes on at the Bema Seat Judgment once we get up there. <laughs> you know, I can only hope that all of my sins are covered under the blood when I get there so I don't have to roast a long time because they got this this fire up there that burns off the shafts and the bad things and leaves only the good things behind. Now you're rewarded for your good things that you've done and you get these crowns and you can throw them at the feet of Jesus. And I don't know. I guess I did need that coffee time <laughs> break that Troy was offering me because I'm fading for some reason. It's dark out. Um, <clears throat> I should have took him up on that break when he offered it. But I will do as my wife often says and push through. Back to 89 Psalm and verse 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. Oh, hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. Well, hallelujah. 
Now, this is a brother writing before Jesus. This was his ancestor, David. Amen. But he knew that the name would be revealed at some point. Now, they had other names for God in the Old Testament, of course. Yahweh and Jehovah and all of these various and sundry names that they used to denote God. But in this here uh, passage, I believe that David was uh, was mentioning the name. They will walk in and they will... Uh, in your name, in thy name, shall they rejoice all the day. Amen? Because uh, I believe that he knew that uh, there would be a name revealed to men in the end time. And I'm going to stand up and see if that doesn't help with my lack of uh, focus tonight and my tiredness. I apologize, my brothers. And my sisters for my apparent lack of energy tonight. Um, let's see. Yes, yes. Okay. Much better. Now, let's look to where we were at here. Well... Thou art the glory, verse 17 says, of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. And then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One, and said, I have laid hell upon I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of thy people. I have found David, my servant, in my holy oil. I have anointed him. David was anointed among all the men in his generations. You know the story very well, how that he was anointed. He had, I believe, a dozen brothers uh, that uh, were the sons of Jesse, and uh, he was the youngest and also the scrawniest and weakest looking of the bunch. He was just out tending the sheep, as you know. He spent a lot of his time out tending the sheep, which was a great, a great skill for him to acquire. And as you know, it gave him opportunities to fight big animals, lions and bears, which of which he killed a lion and a bear both with his bare hands. And uh, in preparation, you see, for the slaying of Goliath, the giant, later in his life. And uh, folks, you build on your experiences. One decision and one experience will lead ultimately to the next. And this is the circle of life. This is like what you go through in your life. Decisions that you're going to make Today will affect tomorrow. The person that you marry today will very much affect where you are tomorrow and what course of action and series of events goes on in your life. Um, so, same for, you know, choosing your friends wisely. They say you choose your friends wisely. You know, if you look at somebody's friends, you could tell a little bit about the person, too. Um... So there's a lot to be said here, but when God chooses somebody, he puts an anointing on their life. As we have seen with Abraham and with Moses and Noah and David and Isaac and Jacob and just so many folk in the Bible that had a special anointing from God and they were able to fulfill whatever it is that God wanted them to fulfill, such as when Moses had to go back to Egypt to free the Jewish people. Now, you got to remember, he was raised in the royalty of that place. Uh, he was raised by the daughter of the Pharaoh as her own son. Whereas all the other young boy babies, boy babies, boy babies I guess, 
were killed at the command of the Pharaoh. Because, you see, Pharaohs consider themselves to be God, and they don't want any competition for that title. Uh, so, my point is, is that Moses had to go back in and demand that the slaves be freed. Now, that would be an awkward thing for any of us to imagine having to do. And it was awkward for Moses. And he didn't feel that he was able or qualified to do this mission. And uh, you have to know that God's anointing was on him. And the whole thing I'm saying is that his experiences growing up as the granddaughter or grandson of Pharaoh, uh, these experiences helped him and molded him and gave him the knowledge of how to approach the Pharaoh later in his life when he came for the mission of freeing all those slaves for 400 years. These men and women of Israel were slaves to the Egyptians. So this was no small feat for them to say, yeah, go ahead and you know, get up out of here. Wasn't going to happen very easily. Okay, so it took an anointing. And it took uh, also several acts of God, literally, as you know the story, the frogs and the locusts and the plagues. And then, of course, uh, ultimately, the death angel actually had to come and return the favor, so to speak, of killing the firstborn son. You know, and I think there was some ironic uh, activity there because of the way that the Pharaoh previously uh, had wanted to destroy all the seed of the of the young babies up to uh, three years, I believe, of age. But Moses was spared as his mother put him in a little basket and sent him up the river. And Pharaoh's daughter, of course, found him and raised him as her own son. All these things has, has transpired to to give him the experiences and had put him in the situation. And of course, he was out in the wilderness for years after he killed that Egyptian. And uh, But he came back and all of his things that he learned growing up came into play and came into um, came into um, to part of his anointing. Pardon me for my my lack of ability to put words together tonight. Lord have mercy. I guess I must need a good night's sleep. But um, thou art the glory of their strength. 17 says, And in thy favor our horn shall be exalted, for the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Whew. Now see, David wrote this a long time before Jesus was ever born. But we sing songs about the Holy One of Israel. Amen. And then we know his name now is Jesus Christ in Nazareth, Yeshua if you're Jewish, Yesu Nam if you're Korean, all right, Jesus if you're speaking to Spanish, whatever. Uh, you know his name. And we can call on our Lord in our time of trial. And as we mentioned with C.K. Quarterman in the first hour, you can mention that name and demons will have to flee. The demons tremble at the name of Jesus. How about that? Ooh, we got some power. And I'm not a power-hungry person, but I believe we should take advantage of that power when uh, we're placed in a position where we need to utilize that power. And I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone here because we all got a little little temptations in life or little things to try to come up to dissuade you, uh, try to stop your your walk with God, your ministry, if you are active in the ministry. Or why the devil's always out to steal, kill, and destroy. We know that. And as C.K. said, in the first hour, the demonic activity, he's dealt with it for years. And I think largely on account of his stance against it and his uh, being involved in deliverance ministry for 30 years has 
ticked off the devil, if you will. And so I'm glad that C.K. still is actively working against the devil, actively writing books on the subject, actively pronouncing, uh, proclaiming, rather, the connection between the giants and the UFO encounters and the New World Order and its fallen angels. And the connection is exactly that, that the angels have fallen from <clears throat> from the second heaven, if you will. These uh, angelic beings that have rebelled against God with Lucifer. Uh, God help us. And then they've, they've got this activity going on, and they're just going to continue to torment people. And I'm telling you folks, if that's you tonight, you need to take up your cross and take the name of Jesus and tell him no. Nah, ain't happening. I've heard a lot of testimonies about it. That it's the only way to come uh, to get the victory over these demonic beings. But enough about all that. I was back in the Word of God. Well, where I belongs, I suppose. I tell you what. Um, I apologize again for coming on here so tired tonight. Um just luck of the draw it's just I don't know what you call it I'm just not really myself tonight um, here we go verse 20 I have found David my servant and with my holy oil I have anointed him that's what got me on all that rambling there is the fact that God will anoint the ones that he has chosen he will anoint them for the ministry he's called them into Amen. And with whom, verse 21 says, My hand shall be established, and my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers and he shall cry unto me thou art my father, my God and the rock of my salvation. You see folks there's an anointing that comes with being chosen by God and he will not put more on you than you can bear in this life. So whatever you're going through tonight I want to take just a moment and encourage you to work through it. God will give you the strength that you need to go through this trying hour in your life. And I understand many of us are in trying times in 2013. And uh, we need to build each other up and edify the church. Last night's episode with Daniel Duvall was just marvelous. Uh, he very much uplifted me. And uh, I know soon we're going to go to probably a one hour a night broadcast um, just because of the amount of irons in the fire that old RPM has. And it's just, uh, it's taken, well, I guess a little toll on me. And that, uh, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and so thin a brother can spread himself before he's just spread too thin. Amen. But I don't want to give up any of the things that God has given me to do in this life. I want to continue being a, uh, a minister of the gospel until until that day when the Lord calls me home or... Until that day when he calls us all home, if that's the day that comes first, amen. I'm down with that. But uh, I understand that there is a circle of life and that sometimes we take ill and we are gone home to be with the Lord. And sometimes it's not an opportune time for us to go. Um, but it's, it's got to be if you have a uh, an illness tonight that is claiming your life. I want to give you encouragement 
and you've served God and you've loved God, yes, go ahead and pray for healing. But if that healing doesn't come, please don't grow bitter toward the Lord. Um, grow stronger as you enter the kingdom of God, as you near your day of exiting this world. And I, I sometimes will tell people, you know, maybe God is protecting you from things that really it would be best for you not to see. Just a thought, folks. I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom. and uh, But these are, are things that cross my mind. Sometimes we don't know what God is sparing us from. And I believe that, as I said, He will give you the strength to go through whatever you must, and He will give you the anointing to fulfill the ministry that He's put on to you. So, um, I want to read back into the commentary, though, because we have read most of Psalm 89. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we see that in 5 to 18, verses 5 to 18, the Lord is glorified for His power and goodness in connection with the covenant. And we've been speaking about the covenant of David. And... Uh, in verse 20 again, I want to say, I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him. Now, we want, we want to ask God to go with us and to put our, our lives under his holy oil. Amen, like he did with King David. But I would say uh, down here to 24, I believe, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. There's in my name again. Um, I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. And he shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. Now, I believe that's a reference to the promise of Jesus Christ, because we know that he was promised to bear the Messiah in his lineage. David was. And we see here in 29, the verse that says, His seed also will I make to endure forever. We know that Jesus Christ is before all, and, and he will be remaining through the end of eternity. And uh, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not, my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. You see, folks, God is not above chastising us if we need to be chastised. Fair warning, okay? If you're living like the devil, don't be surprised. And you're a child of God, and you've given your life to God, and you've consecrated your life to God at some point and been filled with His Spirit, but yet you want to go on living like the world, don't be surprised if God don't bring you under strict chastisement. Because He claims here, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments. Jesus said over and over, if you love me, keep my commandments. So in this instance, if, if these people break his statutes and keep not his commandments, then he says, will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes? Mm -mm -mm. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Ooh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. That speaks volumes to me, folks. 
that speaks volumes. He's not going to let us fail. He didn't let David fail. My covenant, he says in 34, will I not break nor alter the things that is gone out of my lips. Once God has made a covenant, he keeps it. The Bible says that uh, God does not repent of the callings. Uh, something to that effect that he puts online. So that's not a direct quote. Forgive me for butchering that scripture. Um, I don't know what's going on. I'm a little foggy tonight, but I'll be all right. Um, he says here in 35, well, let's read 34. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. And it well, it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. Now, that was the Lord's response. I'm reading the commentary again from verses 19 to 37. This is in two parts. A, it confirms the covenant, verses 19 to 29. But B warns that disobedience and the royal posterity of David will be punished with chastising. And that comes from verses 30 to 32. This chastising began in the division of the Davidic covenant, kingdom rather, and culminated in the captivities. The subsequent history of dispersed Israel bears witness to the continuance of the chastening. Hmm. Now, I want to read a little further, if we have time. We have about six, seven minutes. In verse 38 it says, But thou hast cast off the abhorred, thou hast been wroth with thine anointed Thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant. Thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. Now, in my opinion, it sounds like David's having a, a little pity party. And maybe he's not feeling blessed of God at the moment that he's writing this uh, proverb, the psalm, rather. But um, I think that uh, we all are sometimes guilty of looking at our life circumstances and blaming God for things that are not entirely of his making or doing. And the point is, we need to have faith that God is in control of our lives and uh, at all times. Even when it seems he has left you or forsaken you. He promised he would never leave you or forsake you. Um, this is the time that you should grasp him more strongly and cling to your salvation and the hope that you have. Mm, hallelujah. As the days draw nearer to the, the second coming of the Lord, we should encourage each other with the, uh, the hope that he will take his bride home. Now, in the meantime, we should do all that we can to become more like him. Ladies and gentlemen, just make that your effort every day when you wake up. And I know it's not a popular message, but we have to somehow learn to rely on the spirit that is within us through the power of the Lord and the Holy Spirit that we received is there for a reason, and that is so that we can become overcome us. There's a lot of scriptures, and I've said this many times, that speak of becoming an overcomer in the kingdom of God. So I want to encourage each of you to displain yourself, which is discipline. But my drill sergeant used to say displain. Uh, but uh, it is time we, we take this thing seriously and we learn to be an overcomer for the sake of the kingdom of God and we learn to put away um, our youthful lusts and these kind of things and this is uh, part of the process if you will 
of becoming a mature adult in the Christian faith. Now it shall be established, 37 says, forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. But thou hast cast off and abhorred that has been wroth with thine anointed. Thou hast made void the covenant of thy servants. You see, it's almost like he's accusing God of voiding the covenant. But God does not void the covenant. He says, my covenant in 34, I will not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. So, you know, it's not like he's telling no fibs. God, once he makes a promise, he's down, he's there. It's, it's going to happen. And uh, so we have hope, my brothers and my sisters, for tomorrow. Because the Word of God gives us that hope over and over that uh, Jesus is preparing us to be the spotless bride. Amen. And that there will be some wise virgins all right, when, uh, when the Lord comes back for that bride. Some folks will be ultimately ready and they will be with the Lord forever. First, the dead in Christ shall rise and then those that remain will be gathered with him and with them. So we have hope. And uh, we have hope. Hallelujah. Thou 90 hast seconds. The right hand of his adversaries, and thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. Thou hast also turned the edge of his sword, and hast not made him to stand in the battle. Oh, yes. Thou hast made his glory to cease, and cast his throne down. To the ground, the days of his youth, hast thou shortened thou hast sixty seconds? Shame. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall their wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? So we must remember this when we're praying. We can ask the Lord, as David did, to remember that our time is but a short time on this earth. And we shall not be here forever, and God shall not be patient with man forever. So make the days that you have count, ladies and gentlemen. Put a little effort into your walk with God and say no to sin today. I think that's what we can learn. If, if the Ten need seconds. Be evil away in the name of Jesus and overcome. I give you all that uh, encouragement in Jesus' name. Good night.